with this idea of concupiscence dwelling in man. So by the fact that he had natural inclinations and desires, he had the desire to, desires to be hungry, the desires for love, the desire for companionship. The sin, sin. See, Augustine even believed that, that uh, the marriage act was sin. He even went that far. That, that was sinful, even though the Bible says this, it, that the marriage bed is sanctified. So again, the, everything they teach is the very opposite of Scripture. We could probably do a lesson if we took a, a week or two and put our heads together and come up with every concept that's taught that has to do with redemption or the nature of man, the nature of sin, the nature of God, is opposite of what the Scriptures teach, what they teach in, the, what they teach in theology in the churches. So he's talking about someone that knows the law, that's under the obligation of it. That's why he gives the marriage relation, the, the marriage in uh, the early part of Romans 7, before he gets down to verse 14. He talks about a woman being, being uh, obligated to her husband as long as he's alive, as long as they're married, she's a, as long as she's his wife. So under the obligation, but then when you become dead to the law in Christ, dead to its penalty and its curse, that's what you're dead to, not dead to the moral up uprightness of the law. Well, then the passions and desires are crucified. The members are put to death. The body of sin done away with that you're no longer a slave to sin so that you have freedom from this constant struggle of sin, confess, sin, confess. So you're serving God in the spirit, not the letter. Again, back to Romans chapter 8. So, you know, what, what are we going to... do? You know, the, the righteous requirements of the law are upheld and fulfilled in those that walk after the Spirit and not the flesh. That's why there's no condemnation in Christ <clears throat> for those that walk in the Spirit and not the flesh, that have put to death the deeds of the body because he's talking about, I'm a carnal sold under sin. Now, what he's talking here, if you look at the, you look at the premise established, Paul is he's saying, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal sold under sin. What he's doing is in the Greek sense, or in any sense of writing, of a, of a writing, of something taking place in, the, in your life. He's writing in the historical present, in the first person, so to speak. Just like if I'd write a story about my past life in something, I would use I am in me, as though it's occurring right then, as you're reading the story. But it's in the historical present, meaning, meaning it's something that took place before. And that's, what, that's the same idea here, even, even, even expressed in the, in the Greek sense, if you look it up. It's a person still in bondage to their sinful desires, you know, dramatized in this event where they're wretched, where this is taking place, they're captive, sold under sin, where nothing good dwells in them, where they will to do, but they can't do because they're taken captive by, their, by their, sinful, their sinful desires that they haven't crucified. So they're doing what they hate, and by the progression then of doing that, they become captive, as he goes on to say in verse uh, 23. See, that other, member work, that other law working in my members, warring against the law of my mind, having bringing me into captivity. So see, this is where the contrast is and why the early saints, any spiritual-minded person that's been set free in Christ really through the new birth understands that the new man is set free in Christ. If you're still captive, carnal, sold under sin, held captive by your passions and desires, well, you're not in Christ. You see the opposite here? They say the wretched man, the desperately wicked heart. The scripture says you're the new man in Christ with the passions and desires crucified and put to death, Romans 6, 4. How can you who have died to sin live any longer therein? As he begins the argument, Romans 6, 2. He has a pure heart, not a desperately wicked heart, like Jeremiah is talking about in Jeremiah 17, 10. He's speaking of people that have desperately wicked hearts that need to repent. In the very next verse, he says that God knows the heart, he tests the mind, and he gives to each one according to his ways and according to the fruit of their doings. So they say, you have all our righteousness is filthy rags. The scripture says that the white robes of the saints are their righteous acts in Revelation 19. So again, the very opposite of what they're teaching, their refuge of the Roman seven wretch, I'm constantly under this, this burden of sin and death. And again, they're under the law of sin and death. Because why? Well, be, you're, you're either performing the works of sin or the works of God. 
works of righteousness. You can't escape works. You can't, saying not of works is just a cliche. You can't escape the fact that you're doing the works of the flesh or you're doing the works of the spirit, either one or the other. The works of the flesh are evident, Galatians 5.19, right? In there, fornication and lawlessness and drunkenness and all the other things he lists there. You do those things, you won't inherit the kingdom. So the works of the Spirit are what? The fruit of the Spirit. Long-suffering, love, self-control, virtue, godliness, all those things. So the very, again, you're either doing the works of the flesh, captive sold under sin, or you're doing the works of of righteousness under the law of faith working by love purifying your heart of sin empowered by grace through the spirit set free from the curse of the law of sin and death in christ jesus i am free from the law of sin and death this, for the law of the spirit of life in christ has set me free from the law of sin and death what did you just describe in romans 7 the law of sin and death that took me captive when i sold myself for nothing into sin like Isaiah talks about in Isaiah 52. You sold yourself for nothing, you shall be redeemed without money. Where he talks, leading up to the chapter 3, where he talks about the Messiah. So that's what's, hap that's what's happened to the person that's carnal, sold under sin. Speaking then of, the, of himself, selling himself over to sin, not realizing that he was being held captive by his own passions and desires that must be crucified. That's the condition of a person that's in bondage to corruption, in bondage to their addictions, in slavery to sin, because you are a slave to whom you obey. Sin unto death, obedience unto righteousness. The Lord doesn't say anything. Those scriptures don't say anything. Jesus said you commit sin, you're a slave to sin, John chapter 8. It doesn't say anything about, oh, you've got a sin nature, you're going to sin. No, he said, go and sin no more. He didn't say, well, go and try to sin no more. No, he goes, go and sin no more. Now, you're saying, well, I can't unless I got the Spirit and I'm saved. Well, you supposedly have the Spirit. You've supposedly been redeemed, and you still can't. You still use the cop-out of Romans 7. You're a cop-out of the chief of sinners, the desperately wicked heart in the filthy rags that's speaking of very, very wicked people in the Scriptures in Isaiah 64 and Jeremiah 17 contrasting them with the righteous that are obeying God. So you see the dilemma here. <clears throat> Carnal sold under sin taken captive by these passions and desires is the very opposite of a person that's in Christ, set free from the law of sin and death through the redemption of the blood of Christ that can only set us free from our past, our past sins covered by the blood or forgiven by the blood, remitted would be a better word. Remitted means pardoned. So the curse of the law being the law of sin and death, that I violate the law, I'm under death, so that's got to be appeased. There's got to be a propitiation, which is an appeasement, at the mercy seat where the blood is sprinkled. You're purified and purged of those things, like Hebrews 9.14. How much more shall the blood of Christ through the Spirit purify your conscience of dead works and purify you and purge you for present service? in my paraphrase there, of Hebrews 7.14. Well, how can you be purged of those things and still in bondage to those things? You see what I'm saying? See, that's what the blood, the purpose of it, the blood justifies the mercy at the mercy seat. There's no payment. There's no wrath. There's nobody getting punished in your place. There's no satisfaction. None of that is tenable in the scriptures because it doesn't set you free from this slavery and addiction that you're under. So that's what you have to be set free from, is the slavery and bondage and addiction, not constantly making an excuse for it. But that's what you're taught in the churches. That's what you're presently under the delusion of, like the Romans 5.12, the, the, the Psalm 51.5, and you come out of the womb speaking lies. All those things, you number yourself with the wicked. Every one of those verses talking about the wicked person, not the righteous, thinking that that's going to get you into the kingdom doing the works of sin. Instead of being redeemed from that, see, that's what has to happen. Redemption in the new birth, the washing, regeneration, and renewing has to take place in your life in a radical transformation of your character and behavior 
through this supernatural event of the new birth or you're not going to enter the kingdom. You see what I'm saying? You can't, <coughs> you can't bring, you can't bring yourself, the, theology is not going to bring you into the kingdom. That's what I'm trying to say. Being under bondage of all these supposed flawed doctrines, as I said from the, out, the outset here, everything that's preached, everything that's taught, everything that's written is under this flawed premise of inbred moral depravity and human inability. Everything. It goes back centuries. And it's ingrained into the people where they think that anybody that teaches against it is a heretic in, on their way to hell. See, now when Paul, you know, he goes on and he says, well, nothing good dwells in my flesh. Well, again, they always use the flesh in Scripture as an illustration of the passions and desires given over to self-indulgence. When he says flesh, flesh itself cannot be corrupted because you serve God in the flesh. Jesus was in the flesh. So if the flesh is vile and evil of itself, it's subject to corruption, of course, in the grave, naturally, as 1 Corinthians 15 teaches. But if, it's, but if it's vile and corrupted by sin, how could Christ take up his tent in the flesh body, like it says in, in Hebrews chapter 2? In every way, he was flesh and blood like we were and overcame sin. See, so when he says nothing good dwells in my flesh, he's talking about those passions and desires given over to addiction of the flesh. The unbridled lust, the, uh, the eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. These things sold over to these addictions that are broken only when you come in true repentance. See, those of you that have come in true repentance have seen this occur in your life.